Hello and thank you for being with us. This is our Bible class for Sunday, December the 20th. We're excited that we get to be back in person for our worship service. I hope you're able to join us at 1030 today in person or at least live online. We invite you to worship with us and thank you again for watching our Bible class video. We continue our study of John's Gospel. We left off in John 18 last week and I kind of broke things up just a little bit so that we could continue on with the story because I wanted us to, to look at one specific thing that happens in John chapter 18 and so I, I skipped one section. So let's back up to verse 15. Verse 15 begins, And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest, and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. You get this situation where Peter, and we find out this is John. John kind of has a thing about naming himself in his own gospel. And so Peter and John go together. John is known to the high priest. He's able to gain access. In this situation, it is one of those, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And John is known in those circles. And so John goes right on in. They're outside in that courtyard of Annas and Caiaphas, kind of right there together. And as they come in, Peter gets left at the gate. He's not known by, by the, the high priest and the members of his household. And so Peter comes, and, and it says in verse 15 there, Simon Peter. That's a little bit of an important thing. The book kind of characteristically uses the, the full name. John likes to use Peter's full name when he's been absent for a while, and then he's going to revert back to just calling him Peter. But it does remind us of, of his given name, Simon, that he was born with, and Jesus' name for him, Peter the Rock. And those two come together. He really is Simon Peter. And we'll see his human side on display. Peter and John follow after Jesus after his arrest. We read that all the disciples scattered. And as they scatter and they go through the process of binding Jesus and leading him out, apparently Peter and John kind of turn around and they, they begin to follow after the crowd. And they get to the courtyard, and, and John goes in, but Peter is stopped at the door. Probably actually would have been a gate. This would have been an open area courtyard. And, and John comes back and goes out and talks to the girl who's keeping the gate, the servant girl. In verse 17, the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, You're not also one of this man's disciples, are you? So many powerful things here in what she says. If you just kind of read between the lines just a little bit. First off, she says, you're not, are you? She clearly expects a negative answer. She also says, you're not this man's disciples. There's a tone of derision there. It says, you know, kind of contempt. You're not one of those people, are you? Surely not. And notice she asked, she just asked Peter his affiliation. You say, why would she do that? Well, John is well known. John is well known to them and also well known as an apostle of Jesus. He comes and vouches for Peter. And so maybe she says, you're not one of those people, are you? You're not like John here, are you? And so Peter simply says, verse 17, I am not. Notice he doesn't deny that Jesus is Lord. He denies that he himself is a disciple. He says, no, I'm not one of those followers. And no doubt Peter was tempted in that moment. And certainly if you've ever been tempted to tell a lie, you know the, 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 the temptation there is. If I can just tell one little lie, I'll stay off everybody's radar. It won't make any trouble. It'll all be fine. And I can avoid a big deal. Well, that's a lie of the devil. And that temptation will never pay off as you think it is. Peter says, I am not. We read in verse 18, the servants and the officers who made a fire of coals stood there for it was cold. And they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. In that situation, they're outside in the courtyard. And the Roman soldiers have gone on back to the fortress of Antonia. So this is just the, the servants of the high priest and the officers of the temple police. And they're all gathered together. And it can be kind of cold there in the springtime at night. And so they, they've lit a fire. John says it's a fire of coals, a, a charcoal fire, an anthracia. It's a term that only occurs here and in chapter 21 when Jesus makes it. In both cases, it, it kind of just indicates John has a fondness for detail. That, that's a little specific detail. It tells you you're, you're seeing an eyewitness's account. It took place at night. People are lighting the fire to keep warm. But it also provides light. And, and so 
Uh, normally, the, there's a, a proceeding that would have happened at night. This would have been illegal. We know that the Sanhedrin is not allowed to meet at night. We can tell by the fires outside. This is middle of the evening time. And, and Peter's standing there warming himself. But we just see they're in a hurry to get this done. So they'll meet through the night. And then they'll do everything officially as soon as sunrise begins. Verses 19 to 24 record that interrogation. We looked at them last week. Where, where Annas begins to ask Jesus questions and then has him bound over to Caiaphas, the high priest. And, and in verse 25, now we pick up with Peter again. And this was kind of the story that we wanted to look at. Verse 25 says, Now Simon Peter stood and warmed himself, right where we left him. He's still out in the courtyard. Simon Peter stood and was warming himself. And therefore they said to him, you're not also one of his disciples, are you? Again, notice, first off, they're asking Peter for his allegiance. They're not asking, you don't think he's the Lord, do you? They're saying, Peter, are you one of his disciples? And, and as Peter's standing there, and again, we get Simon Peter, that, that merged name. And notice they ask it in such a way that they expect a negative answer as well. You're not also one of his disciples. These people are the, the servants and the temple police. There's some, some fear here in admitting this to them. John doesn't name anybody in particular, but, but both Matthew and Mark mentioned that there was a girl involved. And, and so perhaps it's another servant girl who may ask this. Perhaps it's that servant girl at the door who kind of prompts the question so that the men ask. But they want to know, Peter, you're, you're not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, and he said, I am not. The, the question that's posed to Peter is almost identical. His answer is almost identical. And, and in Peter, it's kind of implied that Peter would say no, and so it's easy for him to say no. No, I'm not one of his disciples. Peter is denying his own loyalty. He's not denying the lordship of Jesus. He's denying his own loyalty. And then, verse 26, one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately a rooster crowed. So, John tells us that this last challenger is a relative of Malchus, whose ear Peter had cut off. And again, you can see there might be some, uh, some family loyalty coming into play here. And he says, Hey, this is now not a question of, you're not one of his disciples. It's, didn't I see you in the garden? Weren't you with him? Those who had questioned it, Peter earlier had made it really easy for him to say no. This one's a lot tougher. Peter's going to have to outright say, deny a situation. Didn't I see you with my own eyes in the garden there with him? In verse 27, Peter denied having any relationship with Jesus. Mark lets us know that he actually calls down curses on himself at this point, as if to really prove, I'm not one of those religious freaks. And immediately, a rooster crowed. Luke says that it's after the rooster crowed that the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And as they made eye contact, Peter is reminded of exactly what Jesus had said before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Peter never forgets this night. Peter goes through the rest of his life remembering that, that night that he denied his master. And, and perhaps every time Peter heard a rooster crow, he remembered that fateful night when he was too ashamed to even be called a disciple of Jesus. There's so much to, to look at in, in this. In chapter, chapter 18 here, we've seen Judas deny Jesus and betray Jesus. And maybe you say, you know what, Judas, how could you? How could you do that? Judas was a disciple. He was there with all the others. He saw the miracles. He heard the teachings. He, he was in the private moments that Jesus had just with his followers. But, but we're reminded that all of us are susceptible to temptation because Peter gives in to temptation as well. You know, Judas teaches us something about sin, and Peter does as well. First off, sin never delivers what it promises. No matter what it is, it is a lie of the devil. It is false hope. Sin promises peace, but it can't really bring peace. It promises you'll avoid trouble, but instead it brings trouble. It promises to make you well-liked, but instead it leaves you lonely. It promises love, but only brings abuse. It promises power, but brings only weakness. It promises courage, but brings only fear. The promises of sin are always a lie. Whatever Judas thought he was going to get by betraying Jesus, it didn't work out. Whatever Peter thought he would get by denying Jesus, it didn't work out. And we're also reminded you can be near Christ 
and not be saved. It's possible to be in the very presence of Christ. And maybe this is what amazes us the most about Judas. But don't miss that Peter makes the same mistake. You know, how many times have you thought, boy, if I could just see a miracle. If I could just have seen Jesus, heard one of those sermons. Oh, I would never struggle with my faith. But you know what? The guys who did see the miracles and who did hear the sermons struggled with their faith. Judas saw every miracle and heard every sermon and still was never saved. He gave up the salvation that he had. He was never truly converted. You see, to be converted means you got to change. Judas hung around Jesus. He hung around the other 11 disciples. But we read that he, he didn't change who he was. In fact, uh, John tells us that Judas was stealing from the common purse there as well. Judas had always struggled with greed, and he never changed. Jesus said in Matthew 18 and verse 3 that we must be converted if we want to enter the kingdom of God. We've got to be changed. We've got to become a new person. It's not enough to just be close to Jesus. We might say today it's not enough to come to church and listen to sermons. It's not enough to, to click on videos and just uh, attend a, a virtual Bible class. You've got to let it change your heart. You've got to let it convert you. Conversion means a changed life, and simply hanging out close to Jesus is not the same as having a changed life. And we also see that God respects our decisions. Judas chose to betray Jesus, and God didn't stop him. Peter chose to deny Jesus, and God didn't stop him. What an amazing power that God has given us. We have free will to choose, and God, in his mercy, says, I'll respect your decisions. We have the ability to tell the creator of the universe, no, and he listens to us. In John 13, Jesus finally tell, looks at Judas and says, what you do, do quickly. God will honor our decision to reject him. Many, of us, many folks work under this false idea that, that somehow one day we'll repent and get our life right with God. One day. But that time will never come on its own because you wake up every day and have to decide what you're going to do. And you don't wake up one morning and suddenly it's the day you get right with God because God respects our decision, even if it is to reject him and his will. He does not force himself on anyone. You know, we get to choose and God respects our decision. We don't know what Judas's plan was exactly, but whatever it was, it backfired. It didn't work out the way he intended. Because Judas is sorry when Jesus is captured and sentenced to death. In fact, Scripture says he's exceedingly sorry. And really, that's kind of the, the last thing we can learn from Judas. Remorse without repentance brings only dis despair. <coughs> Excuse me. Remorse without repentance brings only despair. It, it can't save you. Being sorry is not enough. Matthew tells us that at some point Judas realizes what he's done and he's sorry. He's exceedingly sorry. So sorry that he takes the money he was paid and he goes and he tries to give it back. And when they won't take it, he throws it into the room and leaves. He was sorry, but sorrow can't save. Judas tried to undo what he'd done, but that can't save us. And what Judas never did was seek the forgiveness of his Lord. He never repented. He never sought the forgiveness, the forgiving power of Jesus. He didn't cry out from mer for mercy from God. He was guilty and he knew it, but he refused to obey even in that moment. Instead, he took his own life rather than bring his guilty conscience before God. Judas is a, a picture of just how dark Satan is and just how far he will take us. Peter, on the other hand, has a similar experience. Peter denies knowing anything about Jesus. Three different times he says, I'm not a disciple. I'm not a disciple. I'm not a disciple. I don't even know the man. But finally, when the dawn breaks and that night is over, as Jerusalem wakes up, Peter realizes what's happened. Peter, the rock, lies broken in pieces over his denial of Jesus. And we can learn that friends won't always be faithful. Humans will let us down. Jesus was hurt when his disciples fled. He was hurt when Judas betrayed him. He was hurt when Peter denied him. Most all of us will know what it feels like to have someone let us down and disappoint us, perhaps even betray us. We'll know what it's like to have our trust broken. Just as Jesus asked his disciples to pray with him, only to have them fall asleep, so we will at some point look to our friends for help and discover they weren't there in the way we thought they should be 
or expected them to be. We'll depend on them and and they'll let us down. What matters at that moment is how badly is not how badly they've hurt us. It's what we do next. It's how we react that's important. Jesus was hurt and yet he offered forgiveness immediately and unconditionally and all but Judas took advantage of that offer. You see, it's up to us to be willing to forgive. And when we mess up, it's up to us to accept forgiveness, to to repent and return and be restored. Our friends won't always be faithful because it's the nature of human beings, but we can always be forgiving. And, And you know, as we learn that friends won't always be faithful, we should also notice we won't always be faithful. It's less than 24 hours after Peter says, I'll never deny you that three different times he denies you. Less than 24 hours after Peter says, I'll die with you, he says, I won't even get in trouble for you. While Peter while Peter has been saying, Lord, I'll die for you, later on he's saying, Jesus who? I don't know the man. We have the best of intentions, but we are prone to fail. We are prone to moments of weakness. We are prone to give in to temptation, as Paul put it. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us is perfect. Even Peter denied Christ. And yet, didn't the rest of the disciples deny him by their absence too? They're not even there with him. As Ken Geyer says in his book, Intense Moments with the Savior, when I'm too busy to pray, I deny that you're the center of my life. When I neglect your word, I deny that you are competent to guide me. When I worry, I deny that you are the Lord of my circumstances. We struggle too. And while we may not find ourselves in a courtyard with a a temple guard asking us if we're a Christian or not, we still fail. And our failure can lead us either to humility or rebellion. Peter's failure led him to humility. He repented of his sins and he got up and he started again to walk with Jesus. Because while our friends won't always be faithful, we ourselves won't always be faithful. God is always faithful. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 verse 13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. You know, Each of us will have to go to that same Garden of Gethsemane moment that Jesus had where we say, I don't want this. And then we're forced to ask, will we be willing to pray? But not my will, but yours be done. Maybe we start asking, Lord, take this away, remove this cup. I don't want this. But can we get to the point of faith where we say, you know what? You're faithful in all situations and I will be too. There is a life that goes beyond our struggles. There is, there is life after our pain and our heartache and our troubles and difficulties. And if we look to God, we can see that he is faithful no matter what. Peter and Judas give us this great illustration of, of how to handle and how not to handle our disappointments and our failures. We also see how the Lord looks at us. We'll pick up in verse 28 next week. As we look at Jesus' trial, and we'll go from his followers, Peter and Judas, and see what they looked at. Now we'll see his enemies, and we'll see their true motivation where they say, we don't care about the truth, we just want this to go away. And we'll see where that leads them and what that does to them. So we'll pick up in verse 28 next week as we continue our study. I hope you have a fantastic week. Again, we look forward to worshiping together later today. Let's pray as we finish our Bible class time. Oh God, our Father. Lord, today we are so appreciative of your forgiveness. We're mindful of our own failures. And God, if we're honest, we're mindful of the failures of those around us. We've been hurt and stung by betrayal and those who have disappointed us. And we've honestly been hurt and stung by our own disappointments and betrayal. Times when we let ourselves down, we knew better but didn't do it. God, we are aware of our sin, but I pray today that we would be aware of your forgiveness and that we would have the courage and the humility to repent. And God, thank you that you promise when we come to you in humility and repentance that you forgive. And that along with your forgiveness is a restoration. God, thank you for your great power that you show, especially when you extend mercy to us and offer us forgiveness. I pray that each of us will do what we need to do in order to take advantage of that offer. In Jesus' name, amen.